Good morning, everyone. Um, very welcome to our first uh, webinar um, by the SMM's new lecture series. Um, thank you very much for everybody who's joined us on this very historical event. Today, we have a privilege of Gary Lane presenting to us um, a talk on optimization. Gary, we um, appreciate your time and I'm sure everybody else is going to is looking forward to this. Um, this is a tremendous step forward for the SIMM. So we are very proud and very excited for this. And it's very nice that Gary is the first um, person who's going to speaker, a speaker who's going to do this for us. Um, we are, we have the ability to um, host some questions. So if there are questions, please put them on the Q&A and I will have a look through them and share them with Gary as we go at, at the end of the talk. So there will be an opportunity. Um, if there's enough time and there's interest, we can also, um, you can also ask questions live at the end. Um, I hope you enjoy this and um, I hope many, many more of these sessions in the next few weeks and please join us. Thank you very much. Gary, please go ahead. Thank you, Isabel, for the uh, introduction and welcome to all the, uh, to all our uh, attendees. I'm just put, just sharing my screen quickly and put the presentation up. All right, so you should all see this. Um, my talk is entitled Maximizing Value, Finding Our System Constraint um, 101. Um, it's, a, it's basically the, the, the fundamentals of any business optimization or continuous improvement program. So I thought it'd be very appropriate as the starting point to uh, to start this series for the SIMM. So thank you to the SIMM for this opportunity. Um, I uh, um, unfortunately have started with the coronavirus. Um, I know you're probably all a little bit tired of hearing about the coronavirus, but I think it's very, very important to understand the context of what I'm presenting in the context of the current situation in the, in the globe, in the, um, in the country or in the world. Um, we're sitting with the many unknowns. We've got a global recession potentially coming up. Um, there might be a reduction in the demand level of commodities. We don't really know. Commodity, must, uh, commodity prices might pull back because of the um, demand reductions and there might be supply um, reductions therefore. And what is the impact on the workforce? Um, particularly in South Africa, we've shut down most of our mines other than the critical mines that are feeding coal into the um, Eskom power stations. So there are a couple of questions that mining would need to, to look at um, in terms of some of the scenarios they're probably playing out and probably a lot of the, the executive boards are probably looking at some of these already within South Africa's mining context and probably also globally. Um, how do we restart operations again and ramp up our production um, in a cash constrained environment? Um, we are definitely going to be sitting with a, a cash constrained environment and how do we actually do that? Um, there might be de market demand constraints. There might not be the demand for all the commodities, which will also be needed to take into account. We might be sitting with a constrained workforce. We're not sure what the impact is going to be um, of, the, um, of the virus and the fact that we've got lockdowns in different countries and a lot of the workers are now maybe stuck in different um, neighboring states and can't move. So we to maximize production again would be challenging. Um, how do we maximize the operational performance with our current infrastructure? So it's really about what, do we got, what we've got in place right now. How do we maximize that performance? And, and the next point really is how do, we minim, how do we do that with the minimal capital available? So if you have a look at the charts on the right hand side, what we're saying is we're probably sitting at the bottom of a performance curve. Um, we're operating far below our capability and how do we maximize that value to the maximum performance of our operation, taking all of those different scenarios into account. Now, mining is a complex dynamic system. Um, if you have a look at it, um, it's particularly challenging. We have operational planning that's feeding into execution and operational planning is about understanding the resource modeling, the production scheduling, the budget, 
And then we've got to execute on all those tasks that we've identified um, in terms of the execution. And, and it, it, it's irrespective of what type of mine it is, we've got a whole host of activities. We've got to then decide on what resource allocation we're going to do across those activities to perform and execute on the schedule that was planned. Um, and feeding up from that, we've got all of our data, we've got probably different um, software systems, we've got a MES control layer, we've got all this data information, and then we've got a whole organizational structure above this that's got different KPIs, um, different areas of responsibility. And how do we take that whole system and generate actionable insights so that we can maximize that performance? And, and in mining, that's particularly challenging because we're sitting with a lot of unknowns in terms of the ore body, um, We've got commodity prices that might be, uh, which are out of our control in most instances. And how do we take that complex system and make sure the right people are doing the right thing at the right time to maximize that system's performance? And that's really what I'm going to be talking about in the next, um, in the next 30 minutes um, of my presentation. And uh, probably, th this is probably familiar to all of you. Um, we generally are overwhelmed by initiatives. Um, Every, every operation that I've been involved in and every project I've been involved in, in, in through my, at my career, there are lists and lists of initiatives and projects that the GM and the, and the management and leadership structure are dealing with. So, I mean, there's a, there's a cartoon I found. I, I actually just changed it to be mining. Um, and, and it says, is this the number, is this the times we move today? And the response is no, it's the number of initiatives we are managing. And I'm going to tell you, there are hundreds of initiatives being done, and we're actually not sure which ones are generating the value we need. And also, importantly, it is, it's, it's taking the focus away from what's important because we're diluting all of our effort within an organization to doing a lot of stuff. Um, and when you dilute your, your focus, uh, you don't do st things properly. And we have got scarce resources, scarce time within an organization, and also scarce capital. So we can't be doing everything. So the key here is how do we focus the scarce resources of the organization to being the right stuff at the right time? Um, and that is critical so that we, we're all focusing on the critical things to maximize the, the organization's um, value. So I'm going to start through a process um, and I'm going to take you through sort of the, the 101 of, of um, business improvement, continuous improvement. And the fundamental starting point is what is your objective? You know, we need to have whatever your system is, what is the objective? Is it to maximize profit? Is it to maximize value? Is it to minimize um, capital? Um, is it to, to uh, generate a certain level of production to meet a demand constraint? And it's critical to, and, and before you can do anything, you need to understand what that system objective is. And interestingly, from my experience with a lot of the boards and excos, this is not so simple and sometimes required to understand your objective. Because if you had to ask people, do you want maximum tons? They're going to say yes. Do you want minimum cost? Yes. Do you want to minimize capital expenditure, maybe re uh, maximize return on capital? Oh, yes, we do. So they want all of it, but often those are competing objectives and they will require different initiatives and interventions. So this in itself is critical before you do anything. And it takes a lot more time than we realize. Um, often we, um, as, as engineers and, and technical people, often focus on solutions and we'll get into, into meetings and workshops and there's lots of solutions that are thrown around. And, um, and, and I, my recommendation would be spend time understanding what is the problem first that we're trying to solve before even throw all the solutions on the table. So agree your objective. So I built a little simple value driver tree here to sort of help to um, explain this. So he has a very simple value driver tree that says return on investment is cash flow minus capital employed, Re cash flow is revenue minus cost, revenue is volume and quality. Um, and you can see there the, the, the green arrows up mean that's good and it improves the return on investment or cash flow. And to be able to improve it, you must reduce capital and reduce cost. All right. So how do you maximize this? So in this example, 
And you're going to find it in most value chains. And dare I say this, um, is there is a cost of doing business. Um, and we often, we often try and constrain our ability to deliver by cutting unit cost. Um, and this is fixation of cutting unit cost. And yes, uh, and, and unit cost is actually just a, a calculated output number. But if you really want to look at a, a system and you understand that a system has a fixed cost, the main lever that you have is really maximizing that system's ability to generate flow. And that's critical. And, you know, I often think we're strangling the mining industry's ability to maximize flow by, um, by trying to reduce this, this construct called unit cost. And, and I'm happy to have a debate with anyone that would like to um, on email or separately after this discussion. So I'm looking now at taking a system. A system has a certain level of fixed cost to do business. There are variable costs, which is its consumption of, of resources to produce flow. And the way to maximize that system's values to maximize the flow out of that system. So step two, after you've agreed, what is it that we want to achieve? So let's say we want to achieve um, value of this um, system, which is maximizing cash flow. Um, the first step is value stream mapping. Now, value stream mapping is, is such a valuable um, tool and it's very, very seldom used. Um, and I would recommend that you do some Google research. There's a whole lot of different value stream mapping tools. Some of them are very complex. It does not have to be complex at all. Um, it really says identify or, or, or map out your activities that make up your value stream. Now, again, it must be at a high level. You do not need to break down every single activity down to the nth degree of detail. If you're looking at mining, you can break it into drilling, blasting, loading, hauling, crushing, processing, and, um, and in processing, maybe if there's three different sections in processing. But understand your overall system. You need to then understand the flow of material through that system. Um, and then I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about tech time and finding constraints. So value stream mapping, critical, critical. Um, I, I would like to see value stream maps on every boardroom wall and in every, in every exco wall in a mining house so that um, everyone understands what the value stream is. We all think we do. Um, often I, they, we'll go to an operation and they'll say, no, of course we know our value stream. And an hour and a half later, we're still debating what, what the value stream is. So it's a critical, critical piece that um, you really need to do. The second thing is, is now you understand your value stream. Um, you need to understand a couple of fundamentals, all right? And some of you might have heard of tech time and tech, tech rate. Um, it, it comes out of the, the concepts of lean. Um, and some mining practitioners will say, ah, oh, mining, is, there's no such thing as tech time in mining. Well, you can call it what you want. It's your, it's your required exit rate that you want from your mine. Now, that exit rate could be um, what the board decides as your target. It could be your strategic target from, from strategic planning. It, it's, your, it's your budget. And fundamentally, it's saying, what do we need out of the system? So in the, in the normal definition of tech time, or tech time is time over metric, whereas tech rate is metric over time. So tech rate, as an example, would be tons per minute. Um, and the way to, to calculate it is what is your customer demand? Customer could be your board. Customer could be the actual customer market, but it basically calculates what do we want from the system in terms of tons per minute from the system. What we also need to calculate is the cycle time of each of these activities. Um, is what is that activity actually able to achieve in its cycle time. And the last thing, which is actually the most complex, is a common metric. It's something that conceptually is very simple, but sometimes a little bit complicated to calculate. If you want to understand the whole value stream, remembering that each of these activities have a different metric that they measured on, all right? And it's not to say we're changing the KPI that they used to measure, but drilling is meters per minute. Blasting is probably blasts, blasts per day, which has a volume. Loading is tons per minute. Hauling might be tons per minute. Crushing might be crushed tons per minute. Processing could be um, all tons per minute. Uh, and your output could be ounces of platinum or kilograms of gold. So the way to be able to understand this value chain is to convert everything into one common metric so that 
you understand each one of those and it does need a bit of maths you'd need to for example in drilling you know you know the pattern therefore you can calculate how many ore tons you are able to produce per meter of drilling so you can calculate the ore tons produced per minute from drilling you can do the same for blasting you know the size of the blast you know how often you blast so you can actually calculate the number of tons per minute from blasting so you'd have to calculate the um tech rate or sorry the cycle times for each of those at the common metric level and that is the most fundamental thing that you have to do and it's applicable to every industry um every industry you have to calculate your common metric to be able to understand your system value chain then you produce a thing called a tech rate chart all right um it's, it's actually just a chart with your activities so if you have a look at this at this chart you've got your activities on the x-axis um, so there you've got drilling, blasting, loading, hauling, crushing. On your y-axis, you've got your tons throughput per minute, which is your common metric. So in this instance, this fact tons, it could be all tons per minute. And then you plot the green line is what that activity can do independently. So we'll talk a little bit about independent variation in a second. But what is what can drilling do in terms of tons throughput per minute? What can blasting do per minute? What can loading do? Um, and that red dotted line is the target that has been set, which we've called tech, uh, target tech rate. That's the tons per minute required. So that's what each activity can do. The red line is what is required. Um, and importantly, it's on a common metric. Uh, and, and again, it's, that's the most fundamental part that needs to be do, done. And this is just a simple throughput analysis now. Um, and that shows the potential of each of those activities. But it's a little bit more complex than this, and I'm going to go through in the next couple of points why it is a little bit more complex. So if you have a look at it, the, the constraint currently in the system, the static constraint, is that hauling activity. It's the activity with the lowest um, throughput per minute. It's actually lower than what the tech rate is. So in, in theory, or in practice, this activity will never ever, even if it was decoupled from the other activities, even meet the tech rate. Now, what's important to understand is this concept works in any industry. Uh, it works in mining. If you have a look at the, the new BMW plant in Roslyn that's building the X3 um, uh, BMW, they have a tech, if you have a look at, and, and if you have a look at what their tech rate is, they export 80, 72,000 cars per year they work i think they work six days a week they work a certain number of shifts um, per week if you just back calculate that tech rate is for, at four minutes i think four minutes 30 per bmw so basically they have a tech rate target of four minutes 30 per bmw so that's the extra rate of bmw's x3s off their production line now what they need to do is map every one of their activities to a common metric which is probably cars per minute and then they need to make sure every single activity can be performed in it, it can be performed in less than four minutes 30 seconds if something takes longer than four minutes 30 seconds like putting on a windscreen then that is a constraining activity now interestingly even if that um windscreen putting windscreens on a car took five seconds more and if you calculate it out i think it works out as something like two thousand cars per year um, difference that it'll make or 10 seconds so you'll see how important it is to understand your cycle times your overall tech time what your target is all right so in this instance hoarding is our activity that is constraining it so now let's have a look what we can do there so importantly it's not as simple as that because there is a thing called starving and choking which in some minds is called consequential downtime it's often not very well captured um, we, we don't capture consequential downtime and in ideally it should be listed as starving and choking. So what it basically says, I'm, a, I'm the hauling activity, I'm operational, I'm available, my, my engineering um, uh, team has, has maintained me, I've got an operator, I'm able to operate and I go to the loader and the loader's broken down. I'm now being choked off material, which is a consequential um, delay likewise i could have gone to loading loading would have loaded me i drove off to the crusher and that crushes down 
Therefore, by, I'm being choked off material. I can't tip the material. That is consequential downtime. And, and it's basically as simple as understanding if, if I'm not able to do the work, am I choked or am I starved? Um, and if it's logged, the hours logged, you can do very, very powerful value stream mapping and constraints analysis just by having those two um, variables. And in a shift, all you really need is to log the number of hours I couldn't operate because of starving and choking. So here's a simple example of how it impacts performance. I mean, there is, a, there is your hauling activity. And uh, what you're really trying to do is you want to maximize that hauling's um, capacity per shift. And if you look on the left-hand side, it's made of throughput rate per hour, which is tons per hour it can deliver. And on the right-hand side, you've got direct operating hours. So that's the number of hours it's going to operate for. So there are only two main levers. How many tons I do per hour and how many hours I have to operate. So let's have a look at the throughput rate. It's your tons per load, which is your bucket full factor, bucket full factor times capacity. So that's why bucket full factor is a critical, critical lever. And your cycle time. Um, cycle time also a critical, critical lever that impacts throughput rate per hour. So those are really two levers. You can also buy, you can have bigger trucks, you can buy more trucks. This is generally what we do in mining. As soon as we need to improve capacity, we buy more trucks, we spend capital. But we've got two big, big levers here that we often miss other than spending capital. Then if you have a look at your direct operating hours, um, on the engineering side, you've got available hours and planned maintenance and unplanned. So uh, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't unplan breakdown hours, but obviously is maintenance, planned maintenance you have to do to get your available hours up. And then you have four delays, external delays, which is something like fall of ground, um, Eskom power outage, weather delay, you know, those kinds of things. Internal delay would be my equipment is available. It's been maintained and I don't have an operator. So no operator available would be an internal delay, for example. And you'll find on a lot of operations, that's a massive, massive amount of hours. And I have written a few case studies. And uh, then the two of the cross is choking and starving delays. Those are big. It's often not understood on operation. It's not captured cor correctly. It's not therefore you're able to be evaluated. And you're going to find a lot of time models are very complex, a lot of variables. Um, and um, and the cap stuff's not captured in the right place and they don't capture consequential downtime properly. So in reality, you really need four variables, four types of downtime capture in terms of operational delays. And that's external, internal choking and starving. And you can do a lot of analysis there. So in reality, even though hauling is your constraint in terms of the green line, in reality, your system will do a lot lower than that, the red. It only, and I call that the dynamic constraint, the system will do significantly lower because that constraint, even though it is the constraining activity, is even being held up more because it's not being exploited properly because it's been starved and choked and there's variability we will talk about in a second as well. So it's a lot lower than we thought. Now, in reality, it's consequent to downtime and there's also variability in performance. So the, every operator has a variability in how they uh, undertake performance of the equipment. The equipment has variability in performance, things break down, every load is not exactly the same and there's a lot of variability in the all um, and the all characteristics and there's variability in the grade. So now you have the system and it doesn't just produce 100 units every single time there's variability in the performance of every one of those activities. And the question is, if every one of these activities on average, and we unfortunately still budget and plan in the mining industry on average, if all of those on average can do 100, what will the system deliver? Is it 100? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second in more detail. So um, in, in reality, Every activity has variability. Um, in this example, for example, you'll see the mean is 10. So on average, it does 10. It sometimes does 12. It sometimes does 8. That blue jagged line is a control chart. Um, control charts are very, very powerful. I'd recommend if you don't know what control charts are, go and do a little bit of um, understanding of them. Importantly, control charts are really to understand common and, and special cause variation, which is not the topic for this discussion. Um, but uh, anyone is well, anyone's welcome to reach out to me if they want to understand more. So in general, 
what we probably do is we probably plan on an average of 10. So when we do planning, this is what drilling will do on average. This is what loading will do. Um, th there's a normal distribution of this, which says, well, we can actually do as, maybe as low as eight and as high as 12. And that's generally, if, if we are gonna consider variability, it's no normally done in normal distribution. But in reality, this normal distribution actually looks like that. There are zero days um, or zero hours when you're being delayed due to consequential downtime. It doesn't always only be um, eight. There are times that it's zero. Um, so the distribution is a very, very skewed um, where there are times when it's very low. And this has a major impact on the performance due to consequential downtime linked through this overall system. So after today, what I would appeal to you is um, if, you've, if you've never heard of the dice game or you've never ever played the dice game, go and do some research on it. It, um, uh, uh, it comes out of, it comes out of um, Goldratt's uh, Theory of Constraints book as well, The Goal. Um, he talks a little bit about it. You can Google it. Um, basically, um, it's, it's a way of demonstrating the impact of variability on a system. So I've played with a lot of Xcos, I've played it with a few boards, and every single time the result is the same and the feedback from the, from the participants is they never realize the impact of variability. So you basically get a dice, you get some, some sugar beans, you have a stockpile, um, everyone throws a dice which represents their individual activity performance. They can throw anything from a one to a six, and on average, you're throwing a 3.5. So on average, everybody throws an, a 3.5 on average. So if you throw 10 rounds, everyone believes that because everyone on average throws 3.5, and there is a little stockpile between each everybody, this system will deliver 35 sugar beans over 10 rounds, which is 10 shifts, let's say. Um, and we show them the impact of that variability by running one round where um, you, you run it where you, if, if you, you throw one, you move a one. If you throw two, you move two. And then we say, fine, let's take the exact so same system. Same average, 3.5. All we're gonna do now is limit the variability. So if you throw a very high number, we're gonna, we're gonna reduce it down to a four. So anything from four, five, or six is a four. Any one, two, or three is a three. Same average, all we've done is reduce the variability. And, uh, and that's really showing it there. So at an individual activity level, same, ver same average, all we've done is reduce variability. So it's the same system. And we design on average anyway, don't we? So what will that system deliver in round one versus round two? And I would recommend you, you do it in the next go, you do it with your board, you do it with your teams to make them understand the importance of controlling variability in performance and what it does to a system. You'll also find something interesting around the stockpile levels and how the stockpile requirements actually get smaller when your variability, and you'll see it in the game. So, uh, so yeah, I appeal to you to play the game. Um, feel free to mail me there. My email address there is on the top of the, um, of the slide. And um, let me know what happens. If you, if you want some instructions, mail me, and I can also just send the instructions to you. All right, so variability is very, very important, okay? So we've now understood we have a tech time target. We have an activity value stream. Each activity has a, a cycle time, importantly on a common metric. We also understand that variability impacts the performance of the system. So how do we take all of those learnings and how do we actually maximize the flow out of that system within that flow? Now, importantly, that flow target might change as we're ramping up production. It might be lower than what we would traditionally have because of current uh, market demand constraints, maybe because of the global recession, but that's all part of this whole process. So let's go through a couple of things that you do. So how do we get, how do we exploit that constraint? So the first thing is we need to protect the constraint all right and protecting constraint is talking about decoupling it so you want that constraint to be decoupled from up and downstream activity variability the way that you do that is through um through buffers so you don't want if there's a is there variability in performance of loading for example it mustn't impact hauling and likewise um crushing must impact hauling if in this example 
Now, those buffers, in some instances, can't be material. Um, they're different types of buffers. You could have a material stockpile. All right, so that's one buffer. Another buffer is additional time to catch up or spare activity capacity. So those are examples of buffers. So we've step one was obviously protect that constraint from any downstream upstream um, variability in the constraint. The, the second thing is you want to exploit that constraint's capacity. You want to make sure that that capacity is maximized. Um, those green, those green um, ticks represent what you can do in that value driver tree. So you've got to make sure that that bucket full factor is sitting as near to 100% every single load. You need to make sure your cycle times are optimized so that every single cycle time is consistent. Now that might need a track and trace solution so you can understand your different elements of cycle time if it's a critical variable. You need to make sure all your planned maintenance hours are, are executed as per plan. Minimize your unplanned maintenance because that creates reliability issues and, and again unplanned maintenance creates variability in performance. So what you want to do is maximize available hours and then you want to make sure you utilize all of those available hours, which means minimize external delays. Make sure you never have any internal delays. Internal delays are no operate available. Shift changeover, massive, massive internal delay. It's normally a quick win. We probably have all these initiatives on the mind. And if you just had a focus on one, which is shift changeover, or maybe operator not available, um, you could harness so much value. Just imagine everyone focusing on, on, on a critical initiative at a time. There's a case study you can find um, that I wrote from a, a really powerful workshop that I had where we had HR, finance, engineering, mining, um, and production all in a workshop, basically going through a value driver tree and understanding their, their respective value drivers of overall group or, or operation performance and uh, talk a little bit about internal delays there. And then obviously, we spoke about protecting the, the activity. So if you get all of those green ticks right, you're maximizing that truck's performance before you've bought any more trucks and spent more capital. Um, in, a, in a market constrained environment, if you do this and you, are, and you have a target or attack rate that's lower than your system capacity, if you do this, you could actually park trucks, take fixed cost out of the system. So that's the way that you would start minimizing your fixed cost of your system. You can't remove variable cost. Variable cost driven off consumption rates. You know, so the way to take out fixed cost is take out a truck park it as an example. So the next thing you need is what's called catch up capacity. Um, in the traditional um, sort of th systems thinking uh, sort of approach, some people call it slack. Um, if you build a balanced system, and, and I'm not going to get into the detail of this, but unfortunately, we're still building our minds as balanced systems. If you build a balanced system, you're going to end up in a, in a, with a system that has a dynamic constraint that's shifting all the time. If you want to manage a, a, a value stream or a mining operation with a shifting constraint, you need a big management structure or big organizational structure to be fighting fires across that value chain the whole time. Unfortunately, as of right now, we're still designing our minds as balanced systems. You've got to design your mind with a fixed constraint in mind. You've got to look at how you to buffer that constraint and you've got to look at how you subordinate the other activities to protect that constraint. And it's called catch up capacity. So in all the, the theory you'll read, if you want to maximize a system throughput, you've got to have slack so that the other activities can catch up to keep that main constraint um, exploited. Now imagine if you had a mine, value stream on the wall, your GM and everybody knew this is the design constraint in the, in the system, you had all your, your metrics on your value chain. It means now all your priority focus during your production meetings is about maximizing that constraint capacity. If you look at engineering maintenance, instead of just dealing with all the job cards from one to 10 that come out of the SAP system, Focus your maintenance activities on that priority constraint. So it's a completely different discussion when you're prioritizing a fixed design constraint in your system. Now, it doesn't say just forget about everything else. No, each of those individual activities must also maximize what they're doing, but it does mean they have catch up capacity to protect the constraint. Now, that does mean that finance mustn't 
asked to sweat the assets. Sweating the assets destroys value. And that's all I'm going to say for now. There's a, another whole presentation I could do on sweating assets and destroying value. So the next thing is reduced variability. It's fundamental. Um, you, if you ever look at the first chart on the left, lots of variability. What you're really trying to do is reduce variability. And as the dice game will show to everybody, reducing variability will improve that system performance. Um, the, the way to produce, I mean, reducing variability um, is all about your operating model. It's around a reliability of planning, execution. It needs an operating model, it needs proper operational planning, it needs proper execution to the plan. It needs proper integrated scheduling. It needs reliability of everything that's been done from a work management routine, levels of work within the organization, and the KPIs that support that overall structure. That's the way to reduce variability. So you'll, you'll hear different organizations talking about operating models. Um, Mark Tofani in Anglo-American Anglo has been talking about operating model. Um, it's all about reducing variability by ensuring that all the work management routines ensure we do the right things at the right time every time. Um, so that's critical, critical to increase, increase, improving the system throughput. So in summary, and this is my last slide, and then I'm going to open up for any questions that might come through the chat, is step one, agree the objective of the system. So it is... Do you want to maximize the, the throughput of the system, maximize cash flow as an example. Next thing is value stream map. And it's very, very important. This needs proper facilitation skills because if you put a whole bunch of technically competent people in a room, we are going to go down into too much detail. It's going to be a big argument about the detail. It needs to be a high level level one value stream map of the main components of your value stream. Then you've got to understand what your tech, your tech rate or your target is. All right, so understand what your demand is, calculate your tech rate, you now need, know, you now need to know what you need to do. So BMW X3 is and I need a BMW every four minutes 50. All right, um, now in the global crisis, you might find the demand reduces, so they might want to change it to seven minutes and then they must look at that value stream uh, and try and reduce fixed cost in that value stream if the system can deliver more than the, the tech time. Um, and do a tech time chart. Importantly, it's about the common metric so that you can understand what each of the individual cycle times are, find where your constraint is, all right? So that's critical. And then you focus everyone's attention on the constraint. That is key because you now need to exploit that constraint. And to exploit the constraint is you're gonna maximize that constraint capacity. Maximizing its capacity means engineering must focus their maintenance on that activity, which gets its availability up. All right, so that's critical. Don't, I mean, if you get five job cards, don't start at number one. Start at the one that is the, the constraint in the system on the mine. Number two, protect that constraint so that it doesn't ever get held up by any consequential downtime. All right, so that's critical. Buffer it. Buffer it is not just material, it could be time, there's a whole bunch of different ways to buffer. Um, buffers are not bad. I know finance will sell their working cap. Buffers, appropriately sized buffers are good. Um, and then importantly, you need slack. You need, need ability for the other activities because there's variability in performance. Things, Murphy, Murphy, Murphy exists in our world. We've got to be able to, um, to catch up if need be because that that buffer must never run empty and the constraint must never ever be held up. That's the fundamentals. Um, there's a whole bunch of tools then around that come out of Lean, Six Sigma, Fear of Constraints, systems thinking that really support this. There are different tools to help increase uh, systems capacity, cross-functional um, mapping, a whole bunch of things, which is not obviously the, fun the, the, the purpose of this presentation. This was to give the basic framework of how you go about taking an operation and maximizing its performance. So I'm going to open up now for any questions. If you have any questions, please feel free just to um, write them into the, into the chat. Um, and we will, uh, and we'll go through any of the questions that you may have. So please feel free to, uh, ask any questions. All right. 
So uh, yeah, first questions from Steve. Um, yeah, Steve, I will share, I'll email it to you um, and anyone else that wants it, um, I'm happy to share it. Um, Camilla will actually share it with all the attendees. So mm -hmm. let's do that, Steve. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gary. This is Isabel. Um, we also um, are recording these sessions for future, um, making them available via the SIMM website. So it, it would also be um, for posterity. And then, Gary, there is also a question um, from Sepela um, on the q and I I don't know if you can spot it. Oh, yes, I see that. Um, Sepela, um, your question is, is planning on average output not a safe way taking into account all variability? Yes. Um, planning on variability, uh, sorry, planning on average is a problem. We, we, in all industries, we plan on average. In reality, we don't deliver average. Um, on activities, we don't take into account the, the variability in performance. I think it's a fundamental flaw in the way we do planning. So the, the easy answer is variability impacts performance and should be taken into account in planning. Okay. And Gary, there's also a question from Alistair on the chat who says, seems to be focused on a single asset. How do you optimize across multiple assets delivering into a single refinery? Okay. All right. That's a very, very good point because that really starts talking about sort of almost portfolio level optimization. Um, and at an individual asset perspective, you obviously want to maximize that, that asset's performance. But if you've got multiple assets feeding into an overall um, constrained um, processing facility, which is typical probably in a, in a platinum mine where you've got maybe a shared concentrate or shared smelting, you'd actually have to start with a what's called a group value optimization. Um, you'll see that Gordon Smith at Anglo Platinum did his PhD on it, where you've got to start looking at the overall maximization, maximizing of that, that portfolio, which will determine the tack time targets for each of the individual assets. So you've got to really start at that top level because what you may find is you know if there's 10 percent too much capacity coming out of all the mines into a concentrator you can't just cut 10 percent all the all of the different um, assets you may find that certain of the assets due to different characteristics of the ore or the grade may generate far better value than others so a group value optimization will will help you set targets per operation which in reality is a tack time then you go into each of the individual assets based on that tack time and optimize that system's throughput all right. Good. I see another question here as well. Um, do you have reference or more reading material to provide further info on tech time? This is new to me and looks okay. 100%. Um, Steve, I'll mail you some more information on tech time. All right. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of literature on it. It's it's really part of lean. All right, Lena asks, do you think that the additional complexity of taking into account variability is worth the effect of fear of complexity, complexity holding us back? Okay. Um, I think that we, we, don't, we don't use, if this is your question, I think we don't take variability into account because often I don't think we actually realize the impact. Um, that's that's what I'm seeing because we are still designing our minds now in this age on averages. So we'll take the average throughput of the crush and the average throughput of screening. So I think we, we don't realize the impact. We have so much good data in mining that isn't even used. So it's I think when you start talking about, oh, there's variability and there's statistics, I think it scares everybody. But it actually is, it, it doesn't need to. There's some great programs that show we can do amazing work by just using some of the historical data. All right. Good. Are there any other questions? I think there was just one from Dick Hruitt who, say, who asked, what is, design, what is a design constraint? Um, perhaps you can just refresh. Okay. So, so any system will have a constraint. All right. It doesn't matter what system you look at. I mean, if you think about even leaving your house and driving to work, there's a constraint. Um, and the constraint's not your car's speed, so you can drive faster. The constraint's probably the, 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 the road capacity, as an example. Now, if you don't design a constraint into a system, you're going to end up, and if you design a balanced system, you end up sitting with a dynamic constraint. So in mining, you need to decide 
and design an actual constraint. So you might turn around and say, okay, and there's a lot of different theories to say, well, you could design it into the most capital, most high, uh, most capital um, extensive resource. It could be the most scarce resource, but you've got to design a fixed constraint into the system, which is what is going to define that system's overall capacity. And then you've got to you've got to then subordinate the other activity. So you've got to be deliberate. You've got to decide where the constraint is, and not just let it happen naturally. Otherwise, it will become a bit um, it will become dynamic. Right. Good. Um, I've got another oh, question. Sorry, yeah. Karen. Uh, please ask the question, uh, Isabel. I'm um, using so, my yeah. <laughs> so the, we just got a question. The common metric you mentioned in the example was or over minutes longer time period. For example, measuring blasting on a per minute basis is impossible. So it's from Gareth Huckle. All right. So Gareth, um, you could probably do it per hour. Okay. Um, you, you could probably do it per hour. I mean. Uh, Interestingly, most of the stuff I've done has been per minute um, because, um, or yeah, you could do it per hour or per minute. It, it doesn't actually matter. It doesn't actually matter. It really just depends on the granularity of your data. Um, we we have just done some work now in a zinc mine in the Northern Cape, and we've we've calculated the MIT, which is metal in cont metal in um, MRC tons, metal in content tons, and we calculate it per minute. Um, and we just converted that whole value stream per minute, including the, the mining side. We could calculate the drilling ore tons per minute or MRC. We could actually calculate MRC tons per minute drilling, MRC minute tons per minute loading, and MRC tons per minute hauling. And we're able to do the whole value chain on, on uh, attack rate per minute. I hope that answers your question, Gareth. Yeah, and, and Gary, I think the comment from Alistair in the chat is um, it's critical to have reliable data to estimate a model variability. The digital world help us with that is actually quite a nice um, segue into what you just said. It, yeah. It's about the kind of information you have and how accurate they are. I mean, um, yeah, no, exactly, um, Alistair. Um, I mean, I, I must tell you, I don't think we use even 5% of the data we have currently. We're now getting even more data and we don't even use what we currently have effectively. All right. Yeah. Okay, um, there was there's one more question um, from and it's uh, the, the person says I came a bit late. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong as I might have missed some information, but I thought I heard Gary talking about maximizing constraint for efficient performance. And I did not quite understand that. Is constraint not a form of limitation to good performance? Okay, so importantly, and, and let me try and explain this, is that every system has a constraint. All right. Your 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 um your task is to maximize that constraint's performance. So if you if you've got a constraint and you have made sure that all the maintenance has been done, if you make sure that you've buffered it and you've done everything absolutely to the maximum to exploit that constraint to the maximum, and that's the maximum that system can deliver. The only way then to deliver more out of that system is to spend capital because you've maximized the constraint. Unfortunately, in mining, what we do is we don't even maximize our current constraints. We probably don't even know where they are. And then we spend money on more trucks, more loaders, more equipment, with actually without understanding the constraint. I'll give you an example. I did a, I did a, a presentation um, in Australia to a whole bunch of PhDs. And um, I was taking them through systems thinking and, and, and the whole idea of, of, um, of value stream mapping. And... Um, and the reason I was doing it was that they were all doing great work. And the overall head of the, of the institute was saying they don't understand that some of the projects aren't adding value. So I presented the whole presentation. Then the guy came to me afterwards and said, you know, I finally understand. He said, I've, I've been doing a project for three years that is uh, looking at optimizing the amps and the power on the, the mill. And I can do the most incredible analysis and, and I've been able to through proper control get 20% throughput improvement in the mill and he says my, my recent client tells me I'm not adding any value I said I don't understand and I said yeah because your mill's not the constraining activity and you can do what you want in milling but you will not get another ounce of gold out of the system so um so I hope I answered your question then I think it was very well answered thank you very much Gary um and Alistair has got another question. Um, first constraint is the ore body and what it can deliver reliably. 
remember the ore body detects. So it's more a comment, but I think we all agree on that for sure. Yeah, 100%. You know, and, and the one comment I want to make, you know, often we say in the mining industry, oh, um, mining is, is more complex than any other industry because we've got variability in the ore body. And that's probably why we need to do more of this type of value stream analysis because if you've got variability in the ore body and you've got a high variability, maybe the variability is actually not even physical variability. It might be lack of confidence in the ore body because we haven't drilled it sufficiently to, to understand it to the right level of confidence. We may need to design a, a value stream that can deal with high levels of variability. Now, I don't think that's ever really done when you design. So design it with, with the assumptions of high variability so that you can exploit that value stream properly and the ore body. I think that's just from a process person point of view. The one, the thing will be really interesting is to say we often um, design the mining activity and the metallurgical processing separate. And that's one of the big things that in my career I've seen is we should be much more integrated because a lot of our variability has different impacts on you know what, what's best for the mine. It's not necessarily best for the furnace or the or the flotation cell. And, and those kind of things is, is something that I think can also integrate that entire value stream of optimization from the mine to the process. Exactly. And I think that's key, Isabel. Thank you for raising that. We still in the mining industry have two silos mining and processing all right and it's about time we broke that down into one value stream yeah that's what we're doing today gary the mining and a metallurgist sitting together and with and, the no, no, yeah. and hopefully we're still in the right we're setting the right tone is about for yes. the industry to to adopt um, so i think we have one more question for you um before we're almost at 11. in your experience what are some of the biggest frustra frustration production companies face and how does identifying constraints help that so. Okay, so I can tell you the bigger frustration, I think, is that they are running around chasing the tails. Um, I think they're just too many initiatives. They're overloaded with initiatives. They're overloaded with uh, consultants coming in with the next big answer. Um, so that's probably the biggest constraint. Uh, everyone's running around chasing the tails. Um, and, uh, and how does identifying the constraint help? Well, very, very simple. It gives you focus. Imagine if you turn around and said, here is the constraint in this operation. We focus our attention on it. it. It will change the whole, the whole, I mean, in theory, that whole list of 120 initiatives that the GM is chasing should be moved down to one. All right. So that's my answer. Yeah. I, excellent, Gary. Thank you very much. I think it answers everything. Um, right. So also from my side, a very, very interesting um, presentation and actually really helpful um, to look at it. From that perspective i do think we often look at ourselves and and, and forget that the the, the the bigger picture um so thank you very much um so i think that brings us to end for today and as you said we will um share a committee will share the, sh the slides with the registered um, attendees um and unless there's any more questions and you want a final comment if that is it for today all right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, Isabel and Camilla and Islamin. And thanks for everyone um, taking the time to listen. And please re reach out to me if you have any questions.